Hey, it's Talk Gnosis. It's a show about Gnosticism. What's Gnosticism? It's whatever we say it is. But actually, all jokes aside, it's a totalizing system that touches upon the most important philosophical currents in the entire West. In tradition, Eastern traditions, the entire world. And to prove that, we have Joanne Leone. You know her, you love her. She's returning to the show. We're going to talk about this. This is going to be uh, part one of 650 about <laughs> Gnosticism and Platonism. Gnosticism and Plato. I'm sure you've heard of this guy. Apparently, he started philosophy, and we're just going to prove how important this weird thing that we're both into is. So, uh, Joanne, not to, not to put too much on your shoulders. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's been a long time coming. It really so has. So. It really has. I've been really looking forward to this one. And uh, again, I got to stop repeating this. People sometimes people say, "Oh, you're so obsequious to the guests." <laughs> and, and what I say to that is, you know, I, I have we have the best guests, right? We we have, we have the best people in the whole world. So uh, that's why I'm so excited to have you on to talk about this this topic, uh, which I think is really going to to expand some minds. So we were talking before the show instead of a, a rigid Q and A, instead of me spitting out questions. You know, we're going to have more of a, a chill talk, like we're out for coffee and two three thousand perverts are listening in. So. <laughs> Can you, can you, I, I guess we, we got to back it way up, right? Um, so uh, I don't know if we want to back it all the way up to, to the big man himself, uh, the number one wrestler in the WWF, uh, uh, Plato. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, kind of the Gnostic currents come a little bit after him, right? In the Hellenistic period with Alexandria and the Greco-Egyptian intellectual tradition. So can you kind of like connect some dots from, from this Plato guy to these sort of later Hellenistic uh, um Currents where we start to see Gnosticism and, and proto Gnosticism. I would love to, but first, I would also like to tell the listeners about our Patreon. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes. Well, tell me yes. more. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, Patreon.com/slash Gnostic, and for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month, you can uh, help us keep the show going. Uh, we have launched a new show. I'm not sure if it's going to come out before or after this. Folks, it's a show that I'm going to guest on, but I'm not on. That's right. You don't <laughs> always have to hear this voice. Uh, Jason is heading up Pop Gnosis, a, a show with uh, B. Skolnick, where he's going to be looking at the intersections of pop culture and Gnosticism. We always want to get out more programming. We don't give anything to our patrons, but if you want something, like this sounds like a joke, just message us because we don't want to put shows behind a paywall. But if there's something else we can do for you, let us know. So as little as a dollar per piece of media per month, you can put a cap on that if you're scared that we're going to do a million pieces of media we usually do about six um you can also do one-time donations at paypal.com or paypal.me i've been giving the wrong address paypal.me slash gnostic and it, we we completely understand uh like i you know the regular listeners and watchers of the show know that i actually really hate doing this commercial and i hate doing it at the top of the show and this is the first show that you've seen of ours because you're a big joanne head you've probably already turned it on you're skipping ahead but uh you know we do need to do it to keep the show going but if you can't help us out financially we completely understand tell people about the show share it we got to play the archons game uh you know the modern archons are algorithms so if you like subscribe leave good comments leave good reviews that that boosts us up uh with, with the archons online game so joanne thanks uh thanks for that wonderful commercial <laughs> and uh now, now answer this very easy question <laughs> Ooh, all right uh classical platonism in a nutshell okay well let me set the scene let me take you back to the fifth century bce in athens you know this time is i guess being called in some ways the golden age of Athens. Um, there's like this period in history between 449, 431 BCE. It's like a time of peace yeah. sandwiched between like the Persian and the Peloponnesian Wars. And in this, like Athenians are living their best life, right? They're headed by Pericles. He's super invested in like art and he's making Athens super prosperous. It's a great environment to live in. And from this, we see the kind of outpouring of philosophy and, well, I should say specifically Platonism, because we do have philosophy happening before this, the pre-Socratics, we have um, Pythagoras and his gang doing what they need to do, right? But we have this guy called Plato and he's just doing some like mind boggling stuff at this time. So um, I should say first, maybe a little bit about Socrates. 
Um, so Socrates is Plato's teacher, obviously. Um, a little bit of a red flag about Socrates, I guess, is that it's really difficult for us to kind of reconstruct his actual philosophy, what he said, right? Because we don't really have any primary sources from the ancient world that kind of really lay out what his philosophy is. Um, and that's not to say we don't have any. Of course, we have Plato's dialogues. Um, we have, uh, I think it's only one source by Xenophon. Yeah, Xenophon and then, yeah. yeah, and then we and, have... And the clouds. The Sorry, clouds. I'm interrupting you. But I, yes. I do want to interrupt you because it's like the, the thing with these three sources is they all portray Socrates very different. So, exactly. uh, you yes. know, it's like, okay, what's going on here? And, and you know, maybe maybe Plato was, you know, I don't want to say he's putting words in his mouth, but he's he's definitely creating a, a certain image, a certain character out of his teacher. Is that fair to say? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Um, I was going to say the clouds about Aristophanes really doesn't paint Socrates in a good light anyway, right? So he, I don't know, maybe he must have pissed off Aristophanes in some way. Like they knew each other or like, you know, yeah. something something went down and Aristophanes is like, well, I'm just going to paint Socrates as this horribly impious person and he just gets what he deserves, right? Yeah. There's, there's one story, uh, again, to interject. That there, is, there is a story, we don't know if it's historically true, that Socrates did uh, attend performances of of uh, of of the clouds of, of, of this play and would stand up and take bows. So, um, <laughs> and it does seem logical that, they, that it, what we do know about Socrates historically is that he was very good at pissing people off. That seems to be something that everybody agrees agrees with about him and maybe that's yeah. a good thing Plato seemed to think it was a good thing yeah whenever I think of Socrates I have this like image of my mind of a three-year-old kid asking why 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 to every question yeah. and there's some people that are like receptive to that usually parents right but there's other people who maybe aren't around children and they just get really annoyed by that and they yeah. just think that this person's really you know just go away stop asking your questions your intrusive questions yeah. um, but I guess, yeah, one of the fund fundamental things we do know about Socrates uh, is that in 399 BC, he was accused of impiety. Um, he had a fairly short trial. As I said, he, like, really annoyed a lot of people, so they were kind of really quick to make that decision. Um, so he goes to jail. He spends his final days not with his wife and child but with a group of philosophers, and he's kind of expounding the meaning of life to them. And then he obviously famously dies by drinking the hemlock. So yeah. that's what we know about Socrates, like, act from his actual life. Um, but, yeah, we know the rest of kind of or potentially know the rest of his ideas from what we read in the Platonic Dialogues. Yeah. Um, so I guess, yeah, the, the kind of Platonist school of thought. Um, so that obviously there was Plato. He was teaching. He was doing his philosophizing. But there was like an official kind of branch that he was teaching from. And that was, of course, the academy. Um, which was an institution of higher learning where people would legitimately come and learn philosophy. One of the most oh, famous I'm people. So sorry, Joanne, yeah, I'm, sorry. I'm going to interrupt Go you for ahead. a moment and I could edit it around this, but I probably won't because I can never remember to. I think <laughs> your hair is brushing up against the mic that's on oh, your, sorry. yeah, so it's making some sorry. static. Okay, yeah, so let's try that. But it's good because, you know, you're getting passionate, you're moving. So, <laughs> um, uh, so, this is, so, so sorry. Um, and, uh, and I want to add one note is, you know, scholars really, they say that philosophy, even though there are the pre-Socratics, there's a before Plato and after Plato, right? And it's, yeah. things are very different after Plato. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, I, there's so like a before yeah. plato and then there's a plato plus i yeah. think yeah so because plato doesn't really ever go away right he's kind of like argued against he's added to he's detracted but he's kind of always just there right he's always there you always have to um, wrestle with him he was a wrestler that's why i keep yeah he was a wrestler. wrestler that's, wrestler, that's yeah. very true yeah <laughs> yeah which is a fun fact we we're yeah. gonna have a lot of fun facts throughout this chat i think yeah um but yeah, so I guess some something um, that people also know was that Plato was also very inspired by Pythagoras and Py by Pythagorean philosophy. So there's a lot of kind of numbers, geometry, that kind of thing, which comes through quite succinctly in Plato's philosophy. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the elephant in the room is his most famous contribution, of course, and that's the theory of forms, <laughs> which isn't really quite well developed in the dialogues so no one has any kind of concrete evidence of what he was kind of talking about until we kind of get to aristotle who tries to flesh this out right mm -hmm. um also is my mic better now is it okay oh, oh yes it is thank you oh, yeah. Yeah, cool. so, um i'm just holding it in a different way so yeah um so 
so yeah, we I guess um, something that's interesting about Plato as well is that when people think of Plato now, they think of the dialogue straight away, right? Um, but there's also the unwritten doctrines. So when people would go to the academy, the what was happening in the academy was that there was largely oral teachings that were happening, right? So I would like to segue into another podcast episode. Um, so if people want to le- learn about Plato's kind of exoteric and esoteric traditions, they can head on over to the Schwepp. The Secret History of Western Esotericism podcast um, because there's a fantastic episode about the esotericism in Plato's doctrines. Um, But what we do know, so obviously these doctrines are unwritten. So no one who attended the school bothered to write them down. They were kind of, you know, I wouldn't say a secret teaching, but a teaching, I guess, for students who were kind of more involved or had a a deeper understanding of Plato's philosophy. Um, And this is where you know some of the really deeply intricate theories like the forms or like plato's metaphysics kind of really get fleshed out and unfortunately yeah we don't have any surviving documents of the unwritten doctrines we only have the dialogues where we get like snippets and you know a sprinkling of of different theories that we kind of have to like really study to piece together yeah, and another clarification again is is that you know th- this isn't Plato writing down systematic uh, uh, philosophy as, as we sometimes know it in, in the modern era. These are dialogues, yeah. right? These are people talking, arguing, and you're mostly supposed to know who who's right and who you're siding with, but maybe not yeah. always, right? Like there's there's ambiguity there. And when you're talking about these oral traditions, well, they, you know these now now obviously they, they there's probably some reality to 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 some of these dialogues. Probably some version of them probably did happen, and then you know, he's, he's kind of cleaning them a- a- afterwards. But if you really think of these these oral traditions, well, you know, th- this is an orality in writing. Um, so it seems quite likely, you know, what you're talking about, that, of course, there's going to be more delivered uh, uh, mouth to ear. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think also an important note to make is that, like you said, you, when people are reading the dialogues, they already know these characters because these characters are prominent philosophers of the time, right? There's yeah. Socrates, uh, there's Timaeus, there's Critias. There's people that are, you know, very well known in, in this circle that are talking to each other, that are discussing ideas. You know, this is this is what philosophy is about. It's, you know, um, being able to articulate your points of view using reason and rationality to kind of get to the, the crux of truth and the problem. And I think, honestly, that's something we should probably um, harken back to in the modern day, right? Yeah. Um, being able to discuss rational, or, you know, rational ideas without, you know, getting our emotions involved, which is something that's kind of really come up in the last few years, right, with the whole internet forums and people discussing and fighting on Facebook and all that kind of stuff. No, for sure. And it's it's really, you know, you're reaching truth together, right? Or reaching yeah. some kind of truth, discovering truth through dialogue, right? So it's not that one person has the truth. It's that it is it is being brought out in, in this process. And, and I think that is something that's really important in these, these classical writings. And as you said, something that, that we really need to recover. For sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think also another point to touch on about the dialogues as well, or, or about platonic philosophy back in the classical period is that Plato loved his allegory right he loved his allegory he loved his myth um, and he liked to intersperse kind of his teachings with a lot of um, religious myth as well so some of the most famous ones I guess are the allegory of the cave um, the myth of Ur that's a really another prominent one and it's going to be important later when we talk about Gnosticism Um, uh, of course yes and the myth of Atlantis very controversial um, that's something a lot of people like to speculate on. Is it allegory? Is it not allegory? Is he hearkening back to a story he heard? Like no one knows, right? It's speculation, but he does like to kind of pepper those things into his stories to kind of flesh them out, right? Yeah. And I think that's really important because, you know, as as humanity, we learn things through storytelling. So I think it's um, really important. And as we're going to see with the Gnostic literature, storytelling is a fundamental component of how we kind of understand the world around us, how we interact with each other, how we interact with kind of lofty, higher spiritual ideas, which is kind of the core of philosophy, right? Yeah. Um, So I guess, you know, yeah, Plato in the fifth century, like you said before, kind of sets up this legacy. Um, And it still continues to the modern day to have this really important influence on our ideas, on the way that we think, 
on the way that we think about how the world is constructed. It's had a fundamental impact on, um, you know, the kind of origins and uh, theology of Christianity in particular, which some people tend to forget or just aren't sure of. Um, so, yeah, so just wanted to pop that in as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Plato is hugely influential in um, the medieval period, particularly in the Renaissance. Um, he made a huge, huge comeback in the Renaissance. There were um, the translation of his texts happening there and kind of these ideas permeating into humanism and that affects the modern age. So it's not something that's just kind of lost in time. It's something that continues to have an ongoing effect. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Any okay. Questions? <laughs> Excellent. No, no, that, that that's great. Thank you so much. And, and of course, you know, you, you are summing up an incredible amount of knowledge. And I really appreciate that you did such a great job. In a nutshell, yeah, yeah. Look at in a nutshell. there's a lot of stuff to get into. Um, if you yeah. are interested or listeners are interested in the ancient world, there's so many resources out, out there, resources out there that you can go and learn. The intricacies yeah. of the academy, like what happened to the academy after Plato, who took it over? Was there an academy? Did it stop? Yes, it did, unfortunately, but it came back later in the fifth century and then it went away again. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah. we will, oh, oh, sorry, I was just going to say we are big Schwepp fans here. You know, I'll try to remember <laughs> to, I always say I'll link things up and I forget, but, uh, you know, sometimes I remember. So I will link up some resources as well so people can do their own research, they could dig in. And, uh, but we do have to, we do have to jump ahead a little bit. So as I said, getting down closer to, to the Gnostics, to perhaps the proto-Gnostics, uh, you know, it's quite controversial if there's, if there's a Gnosticism before Christianity. I, I think that, you know, I personally think that there's, there's something, there's enough there that you can at least say there's, there's a platonic proto Gnosticism, but you know we can see what, what you think. But but get us to uh, get get us to hell to the Hellenistic period, and and get us to Alexandria and the Greco Egyptian tradition, and, and what's going on of all that. Again, an incredible topic. Uh, <laughs> and, and again, look here's for, for the people at home who are who are um, uh, watching on video, and if you're listening as a podcast, you can go watch on YouTube. Here's me in a nutshell. <laughs> Help him in a nutshell. Okay. okay, Austin Powers, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Hellenistic period. Wow, yeah, okay, in a nutshell. So it's essentially three centuries of history between the death of Alexander the Great. Mm -hmm. um, if you and don't know who Alexander again? is. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, you're definitely living, living in a nutshell. Um, Alexander the Great, one of the greatest uh, generals, kings of the entire, I guess, world of world oh. history. Um had one of the biggest empires that the world's ever seen, um, an incredibly intelligent, um, erudite person, was uh, educated uh, by, um, I think it was Aristotle? Aristotle I can't remember yeah. exactly. Yep, yep. yep. Um, so he was, you know, um, culturally Macedonian but also culturally Greek. He had a very firm foundation of uh, philosophy, of understanding um, a lot of the concepts that were coming out of the, of the Greek world. Um, so the Hellenistic period is from when Alexander dies in 323 to the rise of Augustus in Rome, which happens at around 31 BCE, the first century. So a bit of backstory about Alexander. He went on this conquering spree, um, well, to, to have a bit more of a backstory, after his father Philip II dies, he takes over as king of Macedonia and he goes on this expansion campaign to kind of conquer uh, this is what Philip was doing prior to him, so it's not something that's new from Alexander, but he goes on to conquer the Persian Empire and then expand the territory of Macedonia all over basically the Western world and beyond. Um, so in 332 BCE, Alexander captures Egypt, um, which was then a satrapy um, or a province of the Achaemenid Empire, of the Persian Empire. So Alexander effectively becomes the first Macedonian pharaoh or king of Egypt which is awesome for him. You know, there's lots of weird and wacky stories of what happened to him during his time in Egypt. Um, he became deified. He was was seen as a, as a demigod, um, the son of Zeus Amon. Um, there was prophecies made about him. It was a whole big thing. Again, if you're a student of history, love history, there's heaps to read about that. Um, but... He was not a person to stay in one place for a long time. So whilst he was in Egypt, he founded the city of Alexandria, 
and the running joke with that is that he founded an Alexandria everywhere he went. So there's many <laughs> Alexandrias in the ancient world, but the one in Egypt he founded um, and he declared it as the new capital of, of Egypt, the new administrative and cultural capital, which before that time was in Memphis. Um, so Alexander goes off, he does his thing, he conquers, he becomes, you know, a very powerful, influential person, and he just dies all of a sudden, right? Um, and what's controversial about that is that he never actually named his successor. So this kind of started off a whole bunch of infighting with all of his generals again it's like a, a really intense period if you love war if you love intrigue if you love infighting this is the period for you because it all happens and it happens with the greatest empire in the world um but anyway we can fast forward a little bit of that and we can go back to egypt um, which was claimed by ptolemy ptolemy of course was one of alexander's generals and honestly, why wouldn't you want to claim Alexandria or why wouldn't you want to claim Egypt, right? It was an established empire for several thousand years at this point. At this, sorry had, to interrupt. At this point, yeah. the pyramids were, all, were already thousands of years old, right? This literally. is, this is an yeah. yeah, literally. They were already thousands of years old. This yeah. is already an incredibly ancient uh, civilization that had a reputation of being a, a center of civilization, of being yeah. a center of knowledge uh, in, throughout the entire ancient world. So as you said, well, why, why, would that, why wouldn't you want to be the ruler? Yeah, you know, it had already established a political system. It was agriculturally self-productive. You know, it had the Nile, which is one of the most fertile places um, in the Mediterranean. It was self-sufficient. It already had well-developed uh, religious and theological systems. It was ripe for the taking. So Ptolemy came in and he took it. Um, and so he declares himself Ptolemy the I, um, ushering in the Ptolemaic Empire um, and the Ptolemaic period in Egyptian history, um, which as, I guess, spoiler alert, most people know is the, is the last period of the the pharaonic period in Egypt before the Romans come along and kind of plunder everything and take it along. So Ptolemy, he establishes himself and then his subsequent dynasty. Um, again, the history of the Ptolemies and the Ptolemaic Empire is kind of like a keeping up with the Kardashian situation. I like to say it's keeping up with the Cleopatras because there's seven of them. There's like 11 Ptolemies. They're all incestuous and infighting and it, it's just, it's a mess, but it's fantastic. Please go and, and read about the Ptolemaic Empire. Um, but some of the really important things that come out of the Ptolemaic Empire, particularly with the first couple of Ptolemies, so Ptolemy I, who was named Soter or the Saviour, and his son Ptolemy II, that they establish and go on this building campaign to build up the city of Alexandria, right? Everyone, I think, at this point knows about Alexandria, but it was this incredibly, this amazing city. You had the museum, you had the library. It was a place of erudition. Scholars, renowned scholars from all over the world would come to Alexandria to study, to philosophize, to theologize. It was, it became a cultural capital. It was people from all kind of walks of life flocked to Alexandria. Um, it was kind of this hub, this station between the Greek world or the traditionally Greek world in Greece and um, in the Aegean, but also um, it kind of ushered in Greek culture uh, and intermingled that within Egyptian culture as well. That was something that Ptolemy was well known for. Exactly. It's it's a port city. There's a lot of trade. But but as you said, it's, it's this very important center. So the greatest minds throughout the entire uh, Mediterranean slash known world, of course, known, you know, to these empires, obviously the world is bigger. <laughs> you know, they're coming here. They're exchanging their ideas. So you have the knowledge of ancient Egypt. You have the religious practices of ancient Egypt. But then you also have uh, the Greek philosophers, Roman philosophers, uh, perhaps, perhaps some people who are studying Plato. And they're all coming. They're talking. They're sharing they're debating they're mixing together their gods they're mixing together their religions uh, there's a large jewish population and they're um you know there's kind of this cliche or stereotype that that the jews the judeans um in exile you know were, were always uh, uh kept separate from their surroundings right never intermingled never celebrated any other religious ceremonies uh or cultural exchange with the cultures around them but you know at this time that 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 cliche is really not true right that there is there 
Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of Hellenistic Judaism, that becomes a whole really powerful thing. So in the time period, we're firmly within Second Temple Judaism. So um, we're not quite at the end of that just yet. Um, because, of course, the Romans do go on to destroy the temple in 70 CE, but we're not quite spoiler. there yet. Yeah, spoiler, Still a few hundred years before. Yeah, spoiler. Yeah. Sorry, everyone. Um, yeah. yeah, so uh, Hellenistic Judaism is a really particular form of Judaism uh, that combines, you know, Jewish religions, religious traditions with elements of Greek culture. And like you said, there's this kind of intermingling of things that's happening. You know, the Jews are not segregated in Alexandria, particularly there is a Jewish quarter in Alexandria um, where the Jews can kind of live. But uh, the intellectual elite of, of Jewish communities do go to the library. They do interact with other intellectuals. There is this kind of confluence and sharing of ideas. Um, that's happening and it's it's really incredible right so yeah. Yeah. Um, but in Alexandria in particular and I guess sporadically throughout Egypt as well there is this kind of mass migration or diaspora of Jews living all throughout Egypt in this time right mm. um, like I said particularly in Alexandria um, but there's also like quite um, quite a lot of other Jewish settlements that are kind of peppered around um, Egypt at this time um, so, yeah, so there is this period of cross-cultural contact um, and something that's really fundamental, actually, also to the um, to early Christianity that comes out of this period is the translation of the Hebrew Bible, right? This happens in Alexandria, this happens um, at the library, and that's how we get the Septuagint, right? Um, it's the Koine Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. And as you said, um, a lot of Jews in this time were speaking Greek, so there was kind of this... Um, forgetting or there was kind of this uh, Hebrew wasn't quite as prominent as the language as it, as it used to be. Uh, a lot of Jews are speaking Greek. Um, so, yeah, uh, making this Hebrew Bible accessible to Greek-speaking peoples was kind of one of the biggest innovations that came out of this period. Um, but there's also kind of this interaction with um, a, a bit of Greek culture that kind of brings out these like, apocryphal texts, right, particularly the Book of Baruch, which is incredible. Um, if people haven't read the Book of Baruch, please go and read it. It's fantastic. It's amazing. Um, and we have a lot of uh, major writers from this time as well, such as Josephus, who is incredible. Um, but also I think we'd be remiss if we did not mention the, of course, Philo of Alexandria. Um, who kind of just brought this innovation or kind of this confluence between Judaism and Platonism in particular, right? So uh, Philo was reading, he was studying, he was writing, he was a self-proclaimed Platonist as well as a quite a, a, a stringent Jewish man because he thought that the two were inherently compatible, Judaism and Platonism. He's like, yeah, no worries, I see no issues with that, right? Um, so one of the kind of most prominent things to come out of Plato, uh, so come out of Philo, sorry, was, um, his kind of understanding and conception of the Logos, which is fundamentally important, not only for Gnosticism, but also early Christianity, um, and Christianity in general, I suppose. Um, but also Philo kind of has this exegesis whereby, uh, he specifically creates, I think it's six books. There's four books on Genesis and two on Exodus, where he kind of, intermingles kind of Jewish theology and Platonism, Platonic metaphysics, and he kind of uh, plays this out in, in across six books. It's like this kind of philosophical, theological exegesis of Genesis and Exodus, which, again, spoiler alert, is fundamental <laughs> for our understanding of the same things that are happening in later Gnosticism, right? And by Gnosticism, Everyone knows me by now. I'm really only talking about the Sethians. There, they're my peeps. Sorry, yeah. Valentinian fans out there, but yeah, the Sethians, which um, yeah. which we're gonna, I promise, we're gonna get to and we're gonna talk about later. Exactly, and and you know, we we are getting into. You, you were talking about um, Plato's love of myth and allegory, right? And uh, this is what Philo is doing: is really taking these texts and really kind of interrogating them and saying, you know, this, this these these are myths, these are allegories for the human experience, for the soul, for the logos. There's a lot of talk of God's wisdom of Sophia, um, and, and you can kind of see the, the outlines. You can see how the, how. Uh, people uh, who become the Gnostics are, are probably reading him or they're talking to people who are reading them. Uh, and you can, you can see the, 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 
the sort of outlines of of later Gnosticism in, in texts like this, right? And we're not quite at yeah. it's not what I'd call proto Gnosticism, but you know, if, if they're not actually reading Philo, they're they're drinking from from a very similar stream. Yeah, mm, yeah. We have the ingredients there. The, the recipe is kind of coming together. Like the the ingredients are out there, but we're not, we're not quite in the method yet. Um, yes. One of the yeah, one of the fundamental things to come out of Philo as well is that he believed, uh, well, there was kind of this belief in the ancient world, particularly from Philo and people like Menius, that um, that Moses was this kind of um, incredible uh, kind of wisdom teacher, this kind of the pinnacle of what a philosopher should be. And Philo was one of the first to say, well, you know what, actually, Moses was Plato's teacher. That's where Plato is getting all his wisdom from was actually from Moses. So. Yeah, so that's a really interesting and kind of fundamental thing as well, this kind of linking of traditions and kind of seeing Moses as kind of like the preeminent philosophical figure. I think that's really interesting too. Yeah. Yes, well, but I also let's, just Let's quickly, keep going for the ages. Yeah, I don't know. I just quickly <laughs> wanted to touch on the intellectual traditions um, yeah. in Alexandria as well or the Alexandrian mm -hmm. school, which is kind of like this – kind of umbrella term for the the confluence of um intellectual traditions that were kind of um kind of happening at this time which really kind of because ptolemy wanted to set up alexandria as this kind of the best or the the kind of the, the pinnacle of greek culture there was a lot of hearkening back to the classical period right so in the greek imagination in the greek mind the the best time of greek history was during this um golden age of athens this kind of classical incredible period where everything was happening so they wanted to kind of hook in and kind of hearken back to that period um so within the kind of library precinct of course there is the museum that's where stuff is happening and the library is only the repository of knowledge but for some piece of pe reason people don't know about the museum so i always like to put it in there mm -hmm. um but it's not only just philosophy that's being spoken about you know it's it's religion um it's a lot a lot of literary traditions are happening at this time um, I believe that um, Homer's works received punctuation and meter at this time. Before that, they were just kind of like one giant running on book, I suppose. You know, there's a lot of happening. There's a lot of poetry that's happening. There's a lot of plays, comedies that are being written. It's kind of like a cultural hub. It's like where everything's happening. It's that cool kind of beatnik school that people want to go to to be creative, right? Yeah. Um, and so, like I was saying before, it, it attracted all these scholars from all over the Mediterranean, all over the world. People are flocking to Alexandria to kind of flex about their skills as well, right? They, they want to show off how much uh, they know, how intellectual they are, their ideas. And so it's kind of like a melting pot, right? But, of course, we do have to be a little bit careful because most of our sources from this time are from elite sources, so we do have to be kind of a little bit biased. Um, so just, yeah, just to be a little bit mindful of that. Um, but I, I guess now I kind of want to go back to Platonism, if that's okay with you. Yeah, please, because yeah. we really we haven't actually talked that much about the content, right? Now, yes. Which is good yes. because we need to kind of, you know, we're, we're building the flower bed here. We're putting in the fertilizer. <laughs> we're planting the seeds. Now now it's time to to smell the flowers. Yeah, absolutely. Time to so... eat that cake. <laughs> time eight, yeah. I can pick up a few more metaphors. Yeah, so give me some more time. <laughs> so obviously in the fifth century, that's when Plato kind of starts Platonizing, I suppose. Um, and after, you know, there's there's the institution of the academy, which um there's a kind of line of unbroken teachers. Um uh, right up until I think it's 88, um, the consul Sulla, he comes into Athens, he kind of destroys everything, turns the academy into rubble so much so that it cannot physically be rebuilt. It's like completely decimated. But not to worry because Platonism doesn't die there. It kind of keeps going. It keeps moving on. People are still thinking about these ideas. And kind of after the destruction of the academy, um, in the Hellenistic period, we see kind of Platonism being extracted through a very specific lens, and that's through academic scepticism. So scepticism, very kind of in a nutshell, <laughs> once again, broadly speaking, is based on the philosophies of Pyrrhonism, um, similar to Epicureanism, which seek to find the kind of inherent truth um, by suspending belief. So you completely suspend your belief and you kind of get to the inherent truth um, through use of kind of engagement, 
of judgment, of using reason, of using intellect, and there's also this tradition of reputation as well. So that's kind of how Platonism survived for a little bit, but inherently Platonists kind of a, a little bit more interesting than that. Platonism is, you know, metaphysically deeper than that. So uh, academic skepticism really didn't kind of last that long. And yeah. so in the Hellenistic period, um, drum roll please, we have the kind of advent of Middle Platonism, which is uh, something that I'm quite passionate about. Um, so a little bit of background about, and also a caveat, these kind of, these terminologies of like academy, um, Middle Platonism, Neoplatonism, these are not terms that were used in antiquity whatsoever. These are just modern terms that kind of scholars apply to particular periods so we can kind of, differentiate ideas and distinguish right. you know certain people and what's happening so it, it seemed pretty weird if at the time we're like oh yeah we're in yeah. the middle of middle platonism <laughs> yeah 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 you know, i can't wait for the neoplatonists to come along yeah <laughs> yeah yeah well you know it wasn't like plutarch was like oh i'm a middle platonist and then you know plotinus comes along and he's like well i'm a neoplatonist like there was none of that um yeah. although it's interesting to imagine so um so yeah like i said um, 88 BC, no more academy, academic skepticism, but that's not really kind of juicy enough for people, right? They're kind of, um, other philosophies are kind of springing up at this time too. Of course, we have Stoicism, which is one of the main philosophies that is coming out of the Hellenistic period. Um, but we also have Epicureanism and this kind of this like philosophy bubble that's happening, right? There's people that are really on team Stoicism team Epicureanism and then there's people are like well hang on what about Platonism and let's let's kind of bring that back right so um something really crucial that happens in this time period in particular so we're still in the Hellenistic period but kind of uh towards the end they're going into now the early imperial period which is very much in the Roman period um but something that kind of really sets this this kind of philosophy apart is that um, Middle Platonists were returning to um, this use of uh, Plato's dialogues as primary sources, right? So, and from those dialogues, they were kind of ex extracting this kind of systematic interpretation of Plato's philosophy. So, like I said before, to recap, at the Academy, the dialogues were not really used that much. It was more of kind of the oral teaching, the unwritten doctrines. The dialogues are kind of there, but they just remain kind of there-ish throughout history until we get to Middle Platonism when the dialogues are kind of taken at face value. They're kind of extracted for all that good stuff and kind of some really deep intellectual metaphysical um ideas are being extracted right so here is where we're finding some of those really concrete ideas um, about platonism um because and why this is important is because in the dialogues um plato bless him mm -hmm. he had a lot of good ideas but he didn't <laughs> articulate them in a way that was concrete right in a lot of the dialogues he has characters kind of you know hint at the realm of forms, but then that might change in another dialogue or, you know, it's it's kind of not one systematic, universal, concrete idea. It's kind of like, like you know, if we want to use a metaphor, putting ingredients into a soup and kind of letting it stew for a bit, right, but there's not any kind of uh, concrete recipe. It's just kind of ideas, right? Yeah. Um, so fortunately, though, we do have a fellow named Aristotle who was not only pupil, uh, Plato's pupil, he was a student of the academy for like 20 years. So he kind of knew his Plato, right? Yeah. Aristotle and then Aristotle's students come along and Aristotle really tries to kind of elucid, uh, like uh, he tries to systematize and kind of really um, write down and kind of make clear Plato's doctrines. And Honestly, if it wasn't for Aristotle, uh, a lot of Plato's ideas kind of would have been very lofty, conceptual, and not not quite clear. Yeah. So Aristotle and his students really try and work really hard to kind of tease and pull Plato's ideas apart and to consolidate them into like a coherent teaching. So the would, middle. Would you say that kind of? And of course, again, you can see the outlines in dialogue, but it, they're yeah. trying to make them a little bit more practical. Is it? Is that fair to say? Like well, that's how... kind of Aristotle's thing, right? He's yeah. kind of more into materiality and he's kind of into making things more concrete. So I, I guess, yeah, he's totally trying to to um, 
to make Plato's teachings more kind of palatable, to make them kind of more well-rounded and to make them kind of, yeah, more material and concrete. But that's not to say that Plato's metaphysics is kind of completely ignored because that is kind of systematically extracted from the dialogue. So Aristotle's Plato and then the dialogues kind of come together to form this kind of well-bodied system that the middle Platonists kind of riff on, they kind of change, they kind of explore and discover within that kind of conceptual framework, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, so another really important thing to understand about the Middle Platonists is that they were in constant dialogue with other philosophical traditions. And something that's really interesting is that a lot of Middle Platonists actually had a lot of beef with Stoicism. Yes, yes <laughs> unfortunately, J and, J and Jason. Jason's not here. It's all right. Yeah. He's not. He's not going to pop in for out of the frame. <laughs> he's going to do a little, yeah, a little cameo. Um, yeah. and that's not to say that they agreed with all of the tenets of Stoicism, because that's absolutely not true. But there were really core fundamental things that a lot of the Neoplatonists, uh, sorry, a lot of the Middle Platonists, no. had trouble with. Um, sorry, my internet just cut out. Was that all good? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I heard. Yeah, you. Fine. Yeah. okay, yeah. cool. Um, so, uh, and a lot of that comes from, um, specific stoic metaphysical arguments. Um, and one of those arguments critically is, um, the stoic argument of causal determinism. And basically what that is in a nutshell, um, is that the Stoics argued that every single event, everything in the universe is causally determined by the providence of God. and why the, the middle Platonists had a really big fundamental problem with that is because it opens up the avenue of, well, what about evil, right? Yeah. So yeah. if everything's causally determined, logically or rationally, you could also argue that that includes evil. And that was not something that Platonists who are obsessed with the good and the inherent good of the universe are willing to accept lightly, right? So... Yeah. Um, so, yeah, these, these middle platonic arguments kind of really try and refute that story, uh, stoic argument, but they also kind of try and back that up using material from Plato's dialogues. Um, so, um, and the ideas that I'm going to kind of be talking about now are not kind of one cohesive system because, remember, there's no academy, there's no kind of um, school or body that's happening at this time. It's just kind of a bunch of guys that have their own ideas that all turn to Plato as, like, the, the ultimate authority, right? So going to be including ideas from people like Eudorus, Xenocrates, Moderatus of Gades, Numenius, uh, Philo, and, of course, Plutarch. Um, so I guess um, ideas pertaining to cosmology, that's probably um, probably a good one to start with. Mm -hmm. And I guess, yeah, uh, Plato's theory of forms or ideas. So that's a really tricky one to kind of pin down because there are several mentions of the forms in Plato's dialogues, of course, but there's not one specific dialogue or passage in any of the dialogues um, which kind of really... Uh, compartmentalize or kind of really elucidate what these ideas are in a clean way right yeah. it's just yeah. kind of yeah a, a peppering or a sprinkling of kind of run-on thoughts but it's not kind of hey guys this is the theory of forms this is exactly what it is i'm going to spell it out for you no that's not what happens yeah. um and to kind of compound that confusion um in the dialogues plato uses the words forms and ideas interchangeably so here we start kind of getting this mm -hmm. dichotomy and this is something that aristotle picks up as well right mm -hmm. so i'm I'm going to be paraphrasing <laughs> um, very, very poorly, but the idea of the theory of forms is that there's an essentially underlying phenomena or kind of primal form, primal matter that underlies all material things. So for a material object to exist in this physical material realm, it first must have an idealistic form or idea that exists in the intelligible realm. That's basically yeah. what the theory of forms is in a nutshell. Yeah. Um, now here's the kicker. The forms themselves are actually non-physical um, and they're kind of special or unique in that they have no kind of designation, they don't have an orientation in space or time, and they kind of exist outside of the mind, outside of the noose of God, right? So, again, these are very lofty abstract ideas which Middle Platonists are, are kind of trying to make some kind of sense of, right? 
Yep. Um, the forms are apprehended by understanding. Um, spoiler alert, gnosis <laughs> in the Gnostic mm-hmm. context. Um, they're not something that can be perceived by the senses at all. Um, so according to Aristotle, the forms are kind of this important blueprint. Um, the forms are seen as this, you know, this perfect, this beautiful and unchanging representations of objects um, and qualities because, of course, Plato also calls beauty a form in the mm-hmm. dialogue. Um, so I guess just to keep it in mind, just as a well-rounded idea of the theory of forms kind of as a, a kind of quasi-blueprint for the construction of the pleroma, if we're going to going to put it into Gnostic terms. Um, but, of course, there's also that comes from that. There's also a material component, which we see in the physical world, right, as physical beings being um, in this physical world, um, which uh, is kind of in the physical world we have the ability to have senses, to have perceptions. So what we are experiencing of the forms is through our sense perception of these kind of copies of ideas that are kind of coming through. Um but that's kind of all I want to say about the theory of forms. Uh, yeah. and, and, and this, this can sound very lofty and and, and for, yeah. for Gnostics and, and, and fans of the show, a lot of this is kind of sounding very familiar. But, you know, th- th- there's on one level, you know, one interpretation, which, which I don't think pushes out other interpretations. It's, it's this very, like, basic, simple metaphor, right, of having this pure idea and trying to express it. And once you try to materialize it, it goes a little bit wonky. And, you know, mm. that sounds so simple, but but I, I think that that is such a, um, a central idea to both many forms of Platonism and Gnosticism, right? You have this pure ideal, you want to materialize it, it goes a little bit wonky, but shouldn't we still be trying to achieve that pure ideal? And perhaps the striving to achieve that, even if we never reach it, is what makes the world worth living but that's you know that that's i i just want to kind of solidify that a little bit more for, for people that you know that's one interpretation but but, but i think that makes it a little bit more uh, less lofty and, and i think anybody out there who is a creator or a writer or a sculptor or an artist you, you know they 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 know exactly what i'm talking about but i think we all know what we're talking about but uh yes but yeah. thank you for that for that excellent uh excellent summation of these uh very yeah. complex ideas <laughs> yeah i think it's um once you start throwing matter into the mix it becomes kind of yes it it kind of turns into a a a bit of a different thing right you can't capture the unique essence of something that is non-physical in a physical form it it just doesn't have that same language that same kind of embodiment so yeah that's that's yeah the way that you've described it is yeah 100 percent. i agree with yeah um but i guess uh i want to talk about a little bit about the kind of um plato's first principles or his cosmic principles because i guess these are the ones that're going to make a lot more sense from a gnostic point of view and they're kind of the ideas or um the kind of entities beings that kind of find their kind of truest manifestation in later gnosticism so there's a few characters to get through <laughs> in yeah. Plato's cosmology, um, but I just kind of, you know, maybe just want to give a little bit of an idea. Obviously, not a you know exhaustive uh, background analysis of each of each character or an idea, but just kind of a, a brief summary. Please, so, please. And, uh, you know, as I have to say to 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 guests, you know, this, this is the show for, for the real heads. This is the show for the nerds, right? Like they're <laughs> they're they're loving this. They're eating this up because uh, it's awesome, right? And uh, so continue. You go to <laughs> okay. give us the sketches of these. Well, characters. in that case, yeah. yeah. All right. So, um, so like I said before, um, classically Plato was inspired by the Pythagoreans. Um, so there's definitely a kind of Pythagorean influence within the kind of doctrines of Middle Platonism or kind of what comes out of Middle Platonism, and that's most evident in Plato's cosmological schema, um, and it's specifically evident in his doctrine or the principle of the one, right? Yeah. So, um, so we have the one. So the one is Plato's highest level principle of all things right um originally it was conceived by uh, the Pythagoreans as the monad or as the supreme being the divinity or the totality of all things um it is the principle of all things the origin of matter um and all things kind of derive from this one mm-hmm. the caveat though is that the the one is largely unknowable it cannot be intellectualized it's kind of unfathomable um 
with I guess with the human mind, it's kind of really difficult to conceptualize something that's kind of so beyond anything we could ever experience, right? Yeah, you know, some um, some texts may may reiterate, may even open up with the one cannot be known. But uh, continue. <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. And it's like fair enough. It's like a concretely lofty metaphysical principle. We can't really kind of conceive that with a with a human understanding. Um, but it's also kind of called the God above. So yeah. I'll just I'll pop that onto the table and we can revisit that later. Yeah. Um, so confusingly, there's also a second one, and this second mm -hmm. one is also called the monad. Um, mm -hmm. So Plato calls this the great. Um, doctor, mm -hmm. uh, Plato has a doctrine called the great and the small. So the mm -hmm. great component of that is the monad, and the small is the indefinite dyad, which I'll turn to in a second. Um, but the monad or the great, um, so this concept of the great um, is kind of described by Aristotle. So that that's all Plato says about it. It's the great and the small. He, he doesn't have these terms monad, indefinite dyad. That actually comes from Aristotle, who's, like I said, trying to really map out and um, solidify Plato's doctrine. Um, and then these this terminology is kind of really taken up by the Middle Platonists. So in a lot of um, Middle Platonic doctrine, you'll find um, exegesis about the monad and the indefinite dyad. Um, but the monad essentially and the indefinite dyad come out as a pair. So the monad originates from the one and is kind of the first element that is kind of created. Um, it's described as a principle that is ordered, it's definite, it's known, it's male, it's odd, it's right, it's light, and it's the highest order of divine providence. Okay, mm -hmm. so we have, the mo we have the one, we have the monad, and its diametrical pair then is the indefinite dyad, which Plato calls the small. So it is categorized as basically the complete opposite, but not in a negative way, of the monad. So it is unordered. It is indefinite, it's unknown, it's female, it's left, it's even, it's darkness, right? Yeah. Um, and, and for anybody getting confused at home, you, you can Google, and there are literally flowcharts of this. I'm not being confused, are, but you yeah. literally can find flowcharts. So, yeah, so please, I've, uh, yeah. yeah, I've made flowcharts actually for my thesis, but I wasn't oh, really? sure if this is a flowchart uh, flow kind of show or if no. I can share my screen, but I'll just keep going and people can kind of imagine this, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, okay, so we have the one uh, and then we have the monad and then we have the indefinite dyad and it's kind of like this this triad of divine entities, right? So I do want to speak a little bit more about the indefinite dyad because it's kind of the concept that's kind of the most spoken about because it's although it's, it's, a, it's a pair and opposite of the monad, it is kind of slightly closer to material reality. Um, because also the indefinite dyad performs the role of the origin of matter in the universe as well. Yeah. Um, so uh, Alexander, who was a pupil of Aristotle, one of his students, um, he has a, a commentary on Aristotle's metaphysics, and in it he he kind of he, he riffs a little bit about the monad and the indefinite dyad, and he says that they're both manifestations of sensible things as well as... Um, as the forms which are expressed as ideas that emanate from the mind or the noose of the one and act as causes of all other things. So there's this kind of the one uh, with the kind of realm of unknowable forms and we have the monad and the indefinite dyad who kind of bring the forms into kind of a, a slightly more tangible or kind of under, understandable light um, yeah. and kind of they they act as agents of divine causation. So whatever's happening in the noose of mind of God, they kind of kind of make that a little bit more tangible again. Um, the indefinite dyad generates sensible objects for the forms and, like I said, turns them into more tangible forms, for example, such as numbers, such as geometry. So, again, it's quite, a, quite lofty and, and abstract, but it's kind of, now ideas that we can kind of start thinking, oh, okay, yeah, sure, like that's where that comes from, right? Yeah. Um, and so from the indefinite dyad is kind of like the real kind of um, cosmic kind of matter, like the hardcore matter that from, from which the whole universe can kind of unfold. But it's kind of like the real kind of, you know, the primordial stuff, the primordial elements um, which the kind of, which make up the universe, right? Um, so from this kind of cosmic kind of soup that's happening, right, there's the generation of the world soul. 
so the world soul is lit quite literally the soul of the universe. Um, but I should also say before jumping to the world soul that um, the indefinite diet and the monad together kind of form the highest order of divine providence, right? Um, yeah. So they kind of create the concepts of fate and they kind of bring this kind of um, causal or kind of um, metaphysical order to the universe, right? Okay, so that's the monad. Uh, sorry, the one, the monad, the indefinite dyad. So now we'll jump to the world soul. Are, is, is everything making sense so far? Oh, yeah. But uh, I, I know, all. you know, I, I have an outline of this in, already in my head. I okay. believe that it is making sense. But I think that you are explaining it very well, right? Okay. And, uh, and you know, this is going to be new to, to a lot of our, uh, uh, to some of our, our listeners, some of our viewers. But I think you're really laying out the, this, this very these very complex ideas. But, you know, if I see any room for opportunities for clarification, I'll, I'll jump in there. And again, okay. folks, you know, you can look this stuff up. You can read the Wikipedias. And we love hearing from you. You can, you can email me. You can probably email joanne she's busy and be like hey what was that thing about that thing again we'll be like hey it's like this yeah um yeah yeah but uh, also, continue yeah. continue to rock on okay so we have now the world soul which is another separate entity that comes from this it's kind of reborn or kind of generates because of all this kind of cosmic matter this kind of primordial goodness stuff that's kind of floating around right Yep. So it is also called the soul of the cosmos. So it is like the physical embodiment of the soul of the cosmos. Um, and it's kind of a spiritual intelligence um, of the universe. And within it, it's kind of a complete and perfect model that is kind of harmonically proportionate, a mixture of both the kind of the divisible and indivisible. It kind of brings together those kind of opposing elements that are embodied within the monad and the indefinite dyad, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it kind of is like the confluence of opposites. Um, and within it as well, so there's kind of this world soul that forms and that's great, but there's kind of like floaty bits that quite of aren't quite part of the world soul. And those floaty bits are kind of a, a lower grade or a lesser purity and plot twist, there are what the immortal human soul are made of. Who would have thought, right? <laughs> um, so a little bit about kind of the, the immortal souls of humanity. Um, each soul is kind of um, connected or assigned to a particular star that's happening in the cosmos. Um, like I said, it's immortal. So um we'll get to kind of the physical body in a second but once the physical body dies that's okay because this the soul is immortal it kind of just returns to the star after it dies and undergoes this process of kind of reincarnation and regeneration so it's all fine the soul is immortal yep. um so the next kind of um entity that i'd like to kind of talk about very briefly is the receptacle and the receptacle is actually an entity that Plato does spend some time talking on in his dialogues. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but in Plato's dialogues, he calls the receptacle the nurse of becoming. So if people are going to look that up, look up nurse of becoming, and you'll be able to find the iterations of that in the Timaeus, etc. Um, so it's an incredibly obscure concept, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but it is, it is in some ways very similar to the world soul. Um, but however, whereas the world soul is actually a soul, the receptacle acts as this kind of like this womb, this kind of incubation chamber for all the elements, right? It houses all the primordial elements and the primal material um, that makes up kind of the elements right the primal um energies there's earth air fire water um so that's kind of uh where they're all stored ready to be used by drum roll please the demiurge to to form the universe <laughs> um so yeah so i want to talk a little bit about uh plato's demiurge um right. because uh, that that guy's showed up on the show before but this this <laughs> this is really his cousin maybe his grandpa <laughs> maybe you know it's uh, people are going to hear that word uh when they're interested in gnosticism and perhaps have some different ideas than, than what plato had even though they actually are kind of the same guy but we'll we're we are, are going to get to that folks okay same, take it away different. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be on team grandpa here because I think yeah. that's a, yeah, that's a good one. Um, so the Demiurge is kind of, according to Plato, the Demiurge is kind of this intermediary figure. So we have all this like cosmic soup, these divine figures, these lofty abstract ideas that are happening. 
but someone needs to come along to kind of pull all these pieces to get together to kind of consolidate them to actually create the physical universe right because at this point there's no materiality there's no physicality everything is just kind of lofty and spiritual and kind of swimming around right so enter in the demiurge also called the craftsman and spoiler alert for for the gnostics here that are listening the demiurge is inherently good he's only good there is no evil about him he's only good and he is the divine agent who goes on to create the universe so he brings kind of order to this kind of primordial disorder he rationalizes the universe um and this kind of this process of rationalization we'll get into the soul in a little bit but this kind of um there's this middle platonic idea about the soul and the kind of different components of the soul and one part of the soul is purely rational and that's the immortal part of the soul but there's also a a kind of you know a little part of the soul that kind of is because it's housed in matter it's kind of susceptible to kind of um you know lust and kind of the the senses and kind of it's really kind of based in this kind of material sensorial realm and that kind of is what leads the rational part of of the soul astray so um this kind of um bringing order to disorder this kind of um building of the demiurge is something that the rational soul should seek to emulate because another kind of really prominent tenant in ne- ne- um, in Middle Platonism, sorry, I keep going to say Neoplatonism, but that's not for today, um, is that um, the kind of the inner salvation or the restoration of the rational part of the soul um, is what brings personal salvation. And then that is what allows um, a, a person to kind of rejoin in with the um, with the kind of the realm of forms and that kind of higher higher realm in Gnosticism, we call that the pleroma. So kind of rejoining that pleroma. Um, but to go back to the demiurge, um, he kind of possesses his own intelligence, right? He's a completely like he's a good guy. Like he's he's just pulling everything together, right? Um, so once he kind of brings all those kind of elements together and kind of creates a material universe. Um, he kind of makes the universe finally in its complete form. Um, and from that, all species of living things are kind of then able to be created from that. Um, but fundamentally, the Demiurge is like an artist, right? Um, he's not a personal ruler. He's kind of not this kind of malevolent entity. He's basically just a manual labourer, right? He pulls all these things together to create the universe. What the um, word means it's something like yeah craftsman artist yeah. lower artist uh builder exactly. um yeah. but he but he's not quite the architect right he's he's no. uh, yeah 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 he's the manual laborer he the, yeah. he's got all the building materials there he's just the, the one that brings it all together yeah um so yes he gives the physical world a bodily form um it's visible for the first time it's tangible um, it's made up of the elements, fire, earth, air, water. Um, there are now the creation of heavenly bodies, which the Demiurge has uh, created. Um, and he's also created this kind of hierarchy of living beings. So the highest order of living beings that the Demiurge cr- uh, creates are the heavenly gods. So we have to remember that um, Platonism is um, inherently culturally Greek. So the heavenly gods here are portrayed as the Olympian gods, the first and foremost being Zeus, of course. Um, And however, uh, it is, so it's not the Demiurge that creates the human body. He kind of, you know, he's, he's done, he's done for the day. He's clocking off and he gives this responsibility to the heavenly gods. He's like, Okay, guys, I want you to create the immortal, uh, the mortal body for the immortal soul. Create the bodies of human beings, and so they go off and do that. Um, and so the heavenly be- uh, the heavenly gods are kind of also given the responsibility of the second order of divine providence, um, and they kind of use the concept of fate um, as a as a force to kind of control this unruly mortal body that they're creating, right? Um, and this is kind of like the caveat in, in Platonism. And this is, this is a really crucial point because, um, obviously these, these heavenly gods are very newly created beings. They may not understand what they're doing correctly. Um, 
But by using fate as a force to control the body, they're kind of absolving themselves from any future wickedness that this this body may interact or kind of may undergo by itself, right? Um, and just a quick shout out to uh, Numenius here, who was also a Middle Platonist, as I said before, um, but he was also one of the first to kind of write about the human body as a prison of the soul. Yes. So kind of definitely getting this vibe here. So there's this kind of uh, this hands-off approach to, well, the Demiurge didn't create the body, the heavenly gods did, and they may have done it wrong, or they may have kind of crafted the body to be susceptible to kind of the passions and debauchery and lust and all that kind of stuff. But hey, hands off, not my problem. Yeah. And, it, you know, yeah. we, we, we are going to make all these connections, but, you, you know, again, we, we have a very smart audience and I think they are picking out a lot of themes here and enslavement by fate, some some gods who aren't, who, who are a little <laughs> bit wonky at their job, uh, you know, yeah. the body is a prison, a demiurge, a higher god. You know, I, I think that people are, are, are seeing some things that, that, that are pretty familiar, right? And Absolutely, maybe putting yeah. them together. But it's quite interesting that all this stuff is here in Middle Platonism. To be continued. This was part one of three of our Platonism series with Joanne. Tune into part two for more.